welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my host, Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by Autoclose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you uh, tell the audience what we're going to be discussing today? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm grinning already. Did you literally read that off of the Google document we made two years ago? Are you still doing that? <laughs> <laughs> you did, didn't no, you? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I was looking at my calendar, Oliver. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. No, sorry. <laughs> just, I, I just felt like it as soon as you did it and I couldn't concentrate. All right. So taking the mickey from you out aside, um, I wanted to talk about mentorship today. So um, I've had well, mentors unofficially through, uh, through pretty much my whole career. And um, from the lens of I'm a founder, I'm a CEO, um, should I, could I, how do I? And on the flip side, should I be mentoring somebody else as well, whether it be internal or external within your your company or not? So off the bat, um, have you had any? And uh, and if so, how did you kind of get in contact with them and, and what was the use for you? So f- funny enough, um, the mentor that I had was very early on in my career. It actually wasn't even in the tech sector. Um, I was working for a company um, in the CPG. We, we sold the private label shampoo, body wash all over the world. And it was actually the CEO's father who was in his 80s, who I worked with daily. And I will say in the two years I worked with him, I probably learned more in those two years still than I've even learned in the last 10 years. Um, he, he taught me all about, you know, you know, he worked negotiating from, you know, how to write an email, how to finish an email, how long an email should be. You know, he was working with, for example, um, Asia. And he was saying, okay, the way you write somebody in North America in email is very different than the way you have to write somebody in Asia. You can do certain things. So he taught me so much just about business in general. Um, and this was before I became an entrepreneur. So um, still to this day, I think he's now 90. Um, and I still to this day, whenever I reach out to him and we speak, I still give a lot of the credit of my success throughout my life. Um, his name is Louis Waxberg. Um, and I still give him a credit. So I do believe you, you can have a mentor. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in what your business is. It could be a life mentor. It could be someone that's just giving you tips and tricks throughout, but um, definitely very, very valuable. So how did you come to, I know you're working with them, but how did you generate that like cadence of meeting and talking about stuff? Otherwise, because everybody has a lot of colleagues or, or people that are senior to them, don't they? So how did yeah. you get that relationship with him? So I had a relationship with his son who was the CEO of the company. Um, and how I got that was, you know, to no surprise, through tennis. Um, I actually, uh, we belonged to the same tennis tennis club. And uh, I would actually play tennis at 5.30 in the morning before we went to the office at 7.30, almost uh, three to four times a week. So I knew the family for many years. Um, and I knew how successful, you know, they, it, you know successful he was. Uh, you know, just one story for the audience here, I'll tell you quickly. Uh, Louis had a little... Um, a little teddy bear he put just on, on a shirt and he just figured out a way to have a story around it. And he sold, he was buying the, the teddy bears for almost a cent and selling them for eight cents and was selling millions of them around the world in the seventies. So he made his first million off of just the teddy bear that had no meaning. Um, and that was just one of the many businesses he runs. Now he runs a company that does you know half a billion dollars in revenue. Um, that was a few years ago. But he just, you know, I met him through the sun and and then it was kind of like he was taking me as like the young buck under him. If I did something wrong, he'd come over and goes, that's wrong. Don't do it. Do this. Do this. You don't, you know, you don't finish, for example, an email um, when you're sending one to a certain place. You don't send it with, um, you know, you know, regards, Sean. It's always kindest regards or best regards. And that was something he taught me, especially when I was working with, you know, overseas. Um, and he was right. He was also right. You never blame the supplier, you know, you find a way to almost not blame anybody, but you find a way to tell them that, you know, it's not done properly. So it was just a lot of different techniques. You got me even with negotiating with having a ceiling and a floor, you know, if you give the ceiling, let them give the floor and then you want to, you know, trickle only a little bit below the ceiling, but make them come a lot higher on the floor. So you're always above the 50%. And it was just invaluable stuff that I learned for many years. So you, you met him. Um, have you had any others after that? Or have you been sort of, uh, I'm a big believer in the, there's a saying, I don't know where it comes from, that you're the average of the people you spend your time with. So I'm a big believer in that. Well, I think the number's five as well that they say. It's like yeah. pick the five people you spend most of your time with. So I try and spend my time with people who are more like where I want to be going. 
rather than where I am right now. Like obviously I have friends who are like me right now, but yep. that that I find helps me and that that just gets my head in a different space. So aside from that, have you found other ones or, or just kind of what I described? So, you know, a lot of, you know, my friends, my close friends, my handful of close friends have been those mentors. But at the same time, when I look at mentors, I actually look at mentors that are not in the same space as me. Because then we all look at the same lens. We all think the same. So, for example, one of my one of my closest friends um, who I'm actually going to be meeting for dinner today because he just came down to Florida um, has been flipping houses and doing real estate. Right. And for me, it's a passion. And, and every time I, I meet with him, you know, he's teaching me something different, something new. Because I'm, you know, I'm not a handyman, but I do like to dabble in different investments. Um, so he's been he's been good with that. Then I have you know, my other good friend, a lawyer, for example. And you know, I, as a kid, I always wanted to be a lawyer. That was what I wanted to be. Um, so I, you know, I, I I look at him for advice on on many different things, merger, mergers and acquisitions, as one. Um, you know, he was actually the lawyer that helped me with the acquisition with Vanilla Soft. Um, but then we also look at now we're looking at mortgages and mortgage fraud and different things. So I always look at other people to mentor me um, that aren't specific for me to learn more about my own industry. I just go on LinkedIn. I read a lot on LinkedIn. I don't have to. I, I rather have my friends that aren't in the SaaS space that are teaching me. And then for me to learn, I can just go on LinkedIn and see the millions of people that are posting the exact same stuff on LinkedIn on a daily basis and just read as many articles that I find interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've had a bit of both where, uh, I like in the same way as you, my, uh, my uncle was massively into property. So, for, you know, my aim is at some point to go into that with him or, or at least do my own angle of that. So, so hearing his perspective on that stuff is really interesting outside of my work market, if you see what I mean. But when I was a bit younger as well, as, as my cat jumps up, cause she's obviously interested in, uh, in property as well. I always used to ask people who were exactly where I wanted to be, but but had like a very particular um experience so for example um someone who has been acquired as a founder what was that like i want to know i want to talk to you because your company was just like us so i can tie the like dots in my head but that um that sort of helped me a bit and then once you know sort of the most situations that you're going to come across in your career you don't need to do that again really it's kind of the one thing I told myself was don't ever ask them something you could find out or Google because that's a waste of your time and theirs really. So I, I made sure I was very like, nuanced in that approach. But beyond that, I don't, like you said, I don't talk to any uh, other SaaS companies or any marketers per se. I talk to people who have broad strokes, business, you know, experience and things like that. But yeah. I try and get outside of this world that I live in as well. But so, so I'm thinking of, um, let's say you started a new company tomorrow. Would you yeah. outwardly be looking for a mentor or would it just be like a consideration of, oh, I know whoever, let's, uh, let's talk to them about it. Or Because there'll be a lot of founders who think like it's kind of the done thing or it sounds good, but also do I have time? There's kind of like a, a balance there. So that's a great question. And you know, this is something I know probably since the day we've met, we've been talking about it. And there's a lot of fakers out there. There's right. a lot of people out there that that, you know, post and you think, you think is very successful. And I've had this conversation with my wife too, because, you know, back in the day when we first met, it was always like, oh, well, look at, oh, the grass is not always greener on the other side. What you see on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, on all these social videos, that's not the real person. A lot of these people that, you know, are spending and driving those Lamborghinis are in thousands and hundred thousand dollar debt. So they're driving the nice car, but they're in debt. So when I look at mentors, I, uh, and for example, a new business, like I, I had an idea about 18, 18 months ago and I was on a conversation and I can tell right away if this guy is a bullshitter or if this guy's actually providing value. And funny enough, he was the CEO. Um, I didn't even know he gave me the call. He was a CEO of a publicly traded company. And I, actually, my idea was around podcasts, you know, how to disrupt the podcast space. And I had, a, I had um, he was a CEO of a company that was publicly traded on the TSX. I didn't know that at the time. And he gave me an hour conversation on the phone. And ideally what he did was he gave me everything I need to know about my idea. And he gave me the reasons why if he was in my shoes, I can do something bigger and better. And I actually was really, really pumped about the idea. So I always look for the mentors through conversation. So I don't, it's not like I'm going online saying, okay, who can it be? Obviously, if you see a name like, you know, you know, Mark, uh, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, a big name that calls you, which is not going to happen. You know, they can be a mentor. But the problem is defining the right mentors online. And, and we know, you know, you and I know, we have a lot of people that we see on LinkedIn that act like they are 
you know, the king of the world, know everything, but you've worked for them before. I've worked for them before. I've met with them before. I've had podcasts and webinars with them. And they're not as nice or good as you think you see on LinkedIn. So I think you have to be very careful. Um, referrals are great. And whenever I get someone that I think is going to be very knowledgeable and provide value, I always look to see who do we cross-reference and who are we? am I also friends with? I reach out to that person and be like, Dude, is this person for real? Um, you know, and I think this is something I had two weeks ago when I spoke to you all. And I said, you know, this guy came up with this idea. And I spoke to two friends of mine in Toronto that both worked for him at different companies and said, dude, this guy is a product marketer and this guy is for real. Those are the kind of guys I like to talk to. Yeah. So I, I always thought, um, if I get my words out, anybody who's ever been like my mentor, they've always been what I would deem two leagues above wherever I am at my given point. I don't like to think of life as being in leagues because that implies you can get to a top. But for whatever way I'm kind of dividing it in my head, it could be seniority if that is the thing I'm looking for in a, in a career discussion. Or it could be financially, there are, uh, you know, whatever is the criteria I'm going for. I like to go not just one step ahead, but a couple. Because one person who's one step ahead, they might have done it some weird way. They might have had a bit of more help than what I could get or whatever could happen, but they can certainly see, Oh, I was there, you know, years ago. I, and to get to this one and to also get to the next step, that's kind of where I would go. So I wouldn't say, um, let's say it was a career thing. I wouldn't talk to a director of marketing. I would talk to like a CMO, a bigger company. It's much different. So when you're a founder, I think how, how would you approach that? The only way you could probably go is like a, a certain revenue milestone or like a company well, size well, something like that well that's it and for you and I, I i think i've had this conversation with you also in the past is i wouldn't even i wouldn't even have look and just say okay well this person's a cmo or a CRO, and he's gonna be my mentor because to be honest i'll tell you this in startups people throw away t- throw around titles you can have a cro cmo that literally is just in that title you have also companies in the 10 to 25 million dollar range that if you're looking for a merger acquisition those companies are making you, you have to have a C-level CFO, CTO, COO, and CMO. So what you do is you just put somebody in that position with that title, even though you're not paying them as a CMO or CRO, you're putting them in the title. So I disagree with just going after the title. Now, for me personally, I always go after revenue. Okay. I go after founders that have a hit a certain revenue. For example, you know, I hit that, that revenue target between say one and 10 million. For me, I have no problem making building a business to one to 10 million, but do I know how to build the business from 10 to hundred million? No, I've never done it. Do I think I can do it? I think I can do it, but would it be good for me to get mentors that can actually assist me along the way and say, okay, you know what, you know, you know, you know, deplete your cash in 18 months and get rid of every cash and spend it all on growth. So I think you need to really focus. I, for me, I focus on revenue, but also for you is, is that CTO at reputable companies? Do you know people that have worked with that CTO? Like, dude, that guy's a smart guy, man. That guy really helped me with my career. Because if you're just going to go after anyone that's two levels above, you and I both know that sometimes you're going to be people that are just in there, they're faking it till they make it. And then they get fired after four months. They go to another CMO role. They get fired after six months. They go to another CMO role. They get fired after another six months. True, true. Okay, so I I heard something. I want to know what you think about it. I don't know if I agree with it, though. It sounded quite sort of clever if you think about it. So when you get a mentor, there's two things you can do. Normally, you can ask for a specific solution-based advice. I have this problem. What do you think? How do I solve it? Or, you know, how do I go from A to B to C? That's very practical, tangible. Or you can vent and you can talk to them about, well, I've got this troublesome employee or I don't know how we're going to get to this milestone. This competitor's just come along and smashed us out of the park. You can vent. Both are valid. And I think mentors expect a bit of both. What would you say about that? Because I now I'm thinking about it, um, kind of echoing what I said before. I would always make sure that the the minute start was on the Zoom or the whatever with this person, whoever I'm talking to, only they can answer and give the perspective that they are about to give me. And I want to make sure that they're giving the most value back to me because that, that's kind of what they're getting out of it. They're not, you know, if you're mentoring somebody, you're only really getting the kick out of I'm helping them. So make sure that you're making them help you as best as possible rather than sitting there. Like sometimes we ring each other up and we'll just moan about whatever. That's fine. We're buds. But if I was, if I wanted your advice, I would not spend the first 
fifty percent of the call saying, "Yeah, but Sean's so annoying and he doesn't reply to me and whatever," and then get you to respond. I want to get that out. So I, I've heard both sides of that. I think now it's just solution based that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you've come to me before and just said, you know, dude, you have five minutes, can I have your advice? So we, you know, you can't beat around the bush and just give the advice because I think the, the best way you're going to do it is by like continuing to talk to people, right? You want to talk to people as much as you can. So uh, I want to ask you something. I've heard this saying, and um, I'm not sure where I stand on it. I think I've changed my mind a little bit. So uh, as I kind of alluded to, um, when I would approach somebody, I would ask them a, a specific question. Only they really could answer based on their experience. It was that specific. But I would include a bit of context so that they understood like where I'm coming from and why that angle and that particular thing is of use to me. That would kind of sound like I'm venting to them a bit. But but it was contextual. Now I think about it. If if I if I can vent to anybody, then I'm I'm literally losing time on that call with that person. So for you in in your situation, I don't know if you ever went to the the eighty year old guy who because I've forgotten his name. I don't know if you would have gone to him and vented. You would have gone to him for a very particular practical solution based thing. What would what would you do now if you're if you're a founder? Because there is going to be things that annoy you, things that are difficult. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of stuff going on that you want to get off your chest, but also you want to make the best use of that time. So would you would you think about it at all? Would you not vent? Would you vent a bit? What are you doing? Well, I think if if you want to vent, you got to find someone else to vent to. I mean, they're 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 if you, if you're speaking to somebody that's of importance, that you know, time is money, and um, unless they're one of your really really good friends. Um, you want to use that time to answer any of the important questions that you really want them to answer. So for example, I, you know, when I vent, for example, I have my, my best friend, um, we talk business probably 10 times a day, all day. We're, we're giving each other ideas, investments, this and that, what, let's look at this, look at this house, look at this stock, et cetera. But when we come, like when I need someone to vent to, he's the person and I've known him since I was you know 14. But if I'm speaking to, for example, Louis, it was, I would go to Louis with something where I have a question, an answer, and I want his advice, and that was it. Um, and advice was key because sometimes when I was young, I was at this time I was in my early twenties, and like you know, I was I was I was sending and signing POs for fifty, sixty, eighty grand, hundred grand, two hundred grand, million dollar contracts with Walmart and Costco, and they had me do a lot of stuff where I thought I was very young to be doing. So I'd like to double check sometimes early on with him. But, you know, at the end, he kept saying, like, one thing he said is, like, you have to make a mistake to learn. So if you make a mistake, we'll fix it and learn. I made some mistakes that were $20,000. You know, I ordered too many bottles for the shampoo bottles. I ordered an extra 5000 because my numbers were off. My average three months were off. But it was live and learn. Um, but he really, really helped me um, with that kind of mentorship. Um, and uh, and still to this day, you know, I try and cut, touch base more. once a year. We go for coffee. And uh, just to touch base on everything that's going on. And, and obviously, I ask him questions about, you know, certain things in my life, business, etc. Last thing I want to ask you then. So uh, obviously him, you already knew through through another connection. Um, but somebody like the, the founder that was in a publicly traded company, you've obviously reached out to them in some way or another. Um, advice for people who want to reach out to somebody they don't know who they think would be super duper relevant and valuable to, to give them some feedback how would you reach out because there's no shortage of people sending emails to people asking for time you're kind of doing the same thing but it's different i would just be very respectful and very upfront you know if you're looking for say hey listen i'm starting a new business i know you've been in the business in the industry for years been very successful i'm just hoping for ask you a few questions before i you know make sure i'm going down the right path and let me tell you a lot of founders will give you the time i know personally before i started my first business um, I met with about five different people. One was, you guys won't know this, but it's a kind of like a group on in Canada. It was called Wag Jag. It was like the group on in Canada. And I just randomly asked this guy for a coffee. And he's like, and his thing to me was, listen, I only took this coffee because I had a lot of help before I became successful. And it was the same thing with me. So personally, now when people call me, I take calls all the time and from founders looking just because I know that so many people said yes to me. So for me, it's like, I just say yes to a lot of founders that are looking to become successful. Uh, because I was fortunate to have people do the same for me. That's pretty important. I've always thought, oh, it's, you know, everyone's so busy and all that kind of stuff. No. But you would be people surprised how many people will give because they were given. And they'll, yep. they'll kind of see it as giving back. Even occasionally I get reached out to you from people who are younger than me and who are just starting. And I appreciate and remember when I get that email, 
yeah, like that person took that call from me, so yep. I'll do it. And, and I probably will always do that because I enjoy it. Yep. Perfect. Well, uh, I think that was a good episode. Um, so I want to thank everybody here for joining us today. This has been a great episode, a different episode. And thank you for everybody listening. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever you're listening from and subscribe so you don't miss the next show. Thank you again. And Ollie, thank you.